of the, of the semester. And of course, as the anxiety for the festive seasons begins to bite in. Yeah. Um, so, so we'll make sure that the Thursday seminar goes on very well before you know, people rem remember that there are certain things you have to do for the festive season. Um, two announcements. Today, again, in the afternoon, uh, evening at 17 hours, we'll have a book launch by our fellow Sandra Swart on the Lions Historian, Africa's Animal Past, by um, um, part of the work that she did when she was in residence here, which unfortunately I'll miss uh, because I have to attend a meeting in Cape Town as a peer reviewer for the Lancet Commission report on adolescent um, health. Mm -hmm. So that conversation is still going on. So I'm supposed to make some comments on that report that now is out, not yet for circulation, but I hope that after uh, the Cape Town meeting, uh, it will be for circulation, and I'm sure that Linda will be very interested in looking at what uh, the Lassant Commission is saying mm -hmm. after 2016, mm -hmm. I think, that was the last one. <clears throat> but I'll make it back in time to make sure that I'm here for the Thursday, uh, 7th December seminar, uh, our last one by Ham Anton uh, on, 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 uh, on Thursday on plastics for good. And he has already started making sure that you're all going to be here by the yes. chocolates. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that will be in the manor house. Uh, so let me ask uh, Pierre to come and introduce Christian. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Considering the last time, you're thinking. Why in heaven's name did Christian ask me to do this introduction? <laughs> well, the truth is because Christian kindly told me that I'm one of the very few people who he thinks really knows what he's about. And I think I do know what drives him. And it really is a privilege to be able to present him to you. So <clears throat> Christian Senden Cordera is a man in love. He is in love with words, stories and languages, especially his beloved Bicol. He bears the weight of the Bicol literary renaissance movement, says Carlos Ojeda Orias at the first Bicol book festival. He is a poet, a writer, a filmmaker, a publisher and a bookstore owner. He has many, many credits, but before mentioning some of those, I want to tell you more about the bookstore. This was started with a small loan from his mother and has grown into what is now described by the Philippine Daily Inquiry as the creative heart of Naga City. That's where he lives and spends most of his time working. His bookstore is more than just selling books. It hosts workshops, exhibitions, and is a cultural language to a business and is sold to stakeholders who are so impressed by its work that they will keep it as a regional and national treasure. Mm. Christian cares deeply about people. He speaks of the capacity of man and woman to secure their own fate. I'd like to quote what he said at the Words Without Borders program. <clears throat> Our advocacy is to make sure that all languages, including Bicol, be promoted and be given their rightful due as languages of instruction, as languages of discourse. When people disregard their language, they will automatically dis disregard their identities. Language constructs and instructs us. It is our blueprint. Without it, one cannot articulate one's visions nor build upon them. 
Christian is a doer. He is not a talker. He doesn't care much for being referred to as an intellectual, he tells me. I would like to pay him the greatest compliment by saying that after reading some of your stories, <coughs> I went back and I wished to read them again. They are layered and they are about the human condition. I mentioned that he cares about people. He has presented very many seminars about the importance of language, reading and telling stories. He does so as a high flyer at conferences and workshops and also to groups of children. His concern for people led him to study to be a Catholic priest, and he stopped this path in his life only just before taking his vows. One thing we can agree on is after seeing his movie on Thursday, <laughs> that was the right move. <laughs> we need to speak about prizes. Um, now, like Jennifer McCombie and myself, he doesn't like speaking about the very many prizes he's won. By the way, Jennifer doesn't like speaking about them because she's won so many that she's bored. <laughs> and I don't like speaking about them because I've never won any. <laughs> yes, and what Greg so kindly mentioned when he introduced me is true. The one prize I did win was second place for the under 18 B team. And he, as he pointed out, I was 19 at the time. <laughs> there was no need, however, for him to go on and point out that having come second out of eight people running, six of those eight were disabled. <laughs> no, seriously, here at Stias, we like talking about prizes, maybe not as much as Carlos does. <laughs> Christian has won many prizes. The one I wish to mention is that he is the youngest recipient of the Southeast Asian Writers Award, and there are a lot, lot of people in Southeast Asia. From a selfish perspective, I have been very lucky to meet him. We've started a project to showcase flash fiction from the global south via podcasts and via collected volumes. This is also a project with Philomen uh, Luyendula, who is going to come today, but unfortunately has been held up. She is a Congolese, Belgian, French, South African feminist storyteller and translator. Hopefully she will be a fellow here at some stage. Wink, wink. <laughs> Finally, and as you know from when I presented Greg to you several weeks ago, I like to make these introductions also personal. So I asked Christian what he likes doing in his spare time to relax, and he takes part in um, homoerotic mud wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry, sorry, that's all from Greg's talk. Uh, I forgot to mention that Greg's talk, of course. Um, I present to you Christian Sendon from there. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Uh, good morning, everyone. Magandang hapon. Marhay na aldao to our friends in the Philippines. I thank you all. I thank you all for attending this public presentation and special thank you to the novelist Uba Cristina Farra and to the Stias for inviting me to this creative space for the mind and the heart. Boundless is my gratitude. Last Thursday, some of you graciously honored me by attending the screening of our first film, Angustia, which had its first premiere 10 years ago. And I thank you all for the level of engagement you have shown, which I hope will be continued today as I share with you some of my thoughts as I embark towards this new stage of my life, a vita nova, a term which I re-encountered in the works of Roland Barthes, the preparation of a novel. During my graduate school, I first read Barthes in English translation, and I have been haunted by its melancholic meanderings and reflections on photography, on mourning, and on love. His thoughts on raptures that exist between signs and meanings have been with me, particularly in the context of my work as a translator and as a filmmaker. Translation and filmmaking are both rapturous experimentations of crossings and recognizings and recognizing that one does not write 
or the other? How do you move this now? Uh -huh. One does not write for the other to know that these things that I'm going to write will never cause me to be loved by the one I love, the other. To know that writing compensates for nothing, sublimates nothing. That is precisely there where you are not. This is the beginning of writing. I do not know if I completely understand or agree with Bart's on this, but something in his ideas seduces me and makes me think with all my digressions and confessions that I would be making now that I am about to begin <coughs> my new writing. So please bear and be with me. In coming to Stellenbosch last August 27, I arrived with anxiety because of the hostile and cold weather, aggravated my situation that I had to monitor my blood pressure and back home I must deal with the other issues in the university press and in the bookshop plus the other commit commitments I have made. But as days progress and the season changes, I have gradually discovered the warmth of spring in the many friendships and informal dialogues I have made with you all. And since I am a great believer of serendipity, I particularly remember the first three lectures by Greg, Peter, and Pierre on time, water, and debt in that particular order. And these have partially made sense to me as I reflect on my own creative projects, which I have happily conceived here in this most ancient continent. During my stay here, I have decided to want to write a quartet, which will be named Pagasa, which stands as an acronym for the main government weather bureau in the Philippines. It is also our word for hope. What and why about hope? In her book, The Singular Pilgrim Travels on Sacred Ground, Rosemary Pony writes, Hope has always struck me as the most tender of human emotions. It has no guarantee. It requires bravery. It makes the soul vulnerable. And when dashed, it can inflict the gravest of wounds. In his poem, Boy Habla de la Esperanza, I am going to talk about hope. The Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo made no mention of the word hope except for the title. Instead, in the poem, one hears repeatedly the words suffering and pain, purely and singularly, which on hindsight, Vallejo is suggesting that the Dolores is parallel to the experience of hope. That if they put it in a dark room, it would give no light. And if they put it in a bright room, it would cast no shadow. In Philippine history, Andres Bonifacio, who led the secret society that, arch that architected the Filipino-Spanish Revolution of 1896, and who distinguished himself as a fine po poet in Tagalog, chose a nomdiga that is ironically rooted in the word hope. Bonifacio chose my pagasa, which means there is hope. Credited as the father of this first anti-colonial uprising in that part of the world, Bonifacio would die not in the hands of the enemies. Tragically, he and his brother were sentenced to death by his fellow Filipinos. In wanting to write this tetralogy, I am also aware of the fact that the other novelists whose works I have long admired have produced their manuscripts in extremely different and desperate situations, resorting to writing stories in toilet papers and were or are constantly persecuted by their government. This is far, far different from the experience that I have here in Stias. I have in mind the novelist Rumidia Anantatwa of Indonesia and Mugi Wakyongo, Kenya, Persecuted and banned, the works of these two novelists are constant sources of radical hope, 
that articulates the harrowing experiences of colonialism and colonialism. The two novelists I have mentioned have also made the decision to write in their local languages, Gikuyu and Bahasa, something that I plan to do in this project. In the Philippines, the medic Jose Rizal, considered as our foremost national hero, also wrote novels, Noli Metangere and El Filibusterismo, respectively. Noli and Fili, as they are popularly referred, is a diptych that exposes the many ills of Philippine colonial society, lorded over by abusive European friars and spineless Spanish civil officials. Deemed a dangerous man, Rizal was executed in 1896 after a very speedy trial. These novels of Rizal, which were also banned during his time, are now required readings in both public and Catholic educational institutions, making it a burden and a curse to many of our generations. Instead of discovering these novels like a forbidden fruit in the garden, which could have given us the sheer pleasure of discovery since 1956, after the approval of Rizal Bill, we are made to study these novels alongside with his life and works, and have taken these literary works like a bitter pill to cure us and make us our and make us understand our history. By reading and studying his life and his novels, it is hoped that in Rizal we will discover the secrets to become better Filipinos. The result is far different from expected. Why write a novel or novels then? The easy answer would be Rizal himself as the inspiration. He whose long shadow of influence is cast upon many Filipino novelists who have sought to reform our societies by subscribing to the power of the written word. Like novel writing, the nation is an attractive and noble idea that gives us some solidity, a result that comes from a procedural narrative. The epic, or what is the sum total? Epic, probing existential questions that drive community to signify and distinguish itself. But let me digress from here. Following the lecture of our colleague Ingrid, who articulated her ideas on the lived world, let me recount to you mine. Here, I would like to take the two operative words which have guided me thus far, religion and my region. This is a Philippine map, and I'd like you to look at that side. The, color, the colored part is where Bicol is. I live somewhere in the violet. Uh, the food is great in the yellow, so. <laughs> <laughs> My hypothesis is this. The colonial religion has engineered our region. Bicol, our geography, our language, my soul and soul's possession, allowing me nothing but a pigment of the firmament, a soft glance to eternity I once saw as a child in those community novenas where people pray and sing our stories in a syncretic vehicle, and we feast and dance with our pains and misfortunes. Minsan daing paros firming mayahay, kung si isa sa indo ang nasasakitan, dumuman sa samo tulos maumayan. Even if there is no wind, life is always bearable. Whoever is burdened, come to our world and you shall be relieved. That's the lyrics of the song which we use in our dancing. It is my hope that by giving you a glance to this live world, I will be able to solicit to you your most gener generous and insight that may help me gain courage and freedom in writing these novels. To borrow the words of Arun Hati Roy, to be as complicated as I want, to move through worlds, languages, and time, and through societies, communities, and politics.
Like many other Catholic families in the Philippines, mine had to entreat, entreat, entreat heavens to gain the favor of having a child by praying the novena. After three miscarriages, my future mother decided to pray the novena to San Ramon, one of the patron saints for expectant mothers, and to Nuestra Señora de Salvación, a Marian image popularly venerated in Quran, a remote village in TV Albay. Together with my father and the other members of my mother's family, they also vowed that if the prayers, if their <coughs> prayers would be granted, and if the child would be a boy, they would send the child to the seminary and would help him become a Catholic priest. Their prayers were granted. I was given the name Christian to mark the fulfillment of this contract or this promesa. Two years after, another baby was born. The saints are working hard. She was given the name Filipinas because my mother gave birth to her during the country's Independence Day anniversary. And then the youngest born is named Bashir, a name given by my mother's sister in honor of her first Arab boyfriend. <laughs> that's, that's, that's world history. In Penelo Canel's book, Power and Intimacy in the Christian Philippines, this contract between patron saints and the devotees is done by performing the novena, the Passion or the Aurora, the religious procession at night or dawn. One performs the religious text as a contract. The script composed of prayers and verses contract and construct the communities together. Interestingly, Canel distinguishes in her book the concept of tabang or help and utang, debt, which for Canel is also translated within the relationship that exists between the patron saint and the supplicant. The patron supplicant relation is reflected even among familial relationships. However, it is observed that people would not be able to pay their utang or debt to their kin because such confusion exists between what is a tabang, a help, or an utang. To explain this, Canel points out to the relationship that exists between family members and the patron saint who is considered as part of the family. Hence, one does not make an utang or a debt to a saint. As far as I remember, this has become the narrative that my elders, including my parents, made me believe and accept. I was a sort of a special child because of the promise they made to the saints. My birthright lies therefore not on my being the firstborn in the family, but in the belief that I was heaven's response to them, atabang. Hence, I was no stranger to performing the role of a priest even as a child. After attending the Mass through the radio, I would also summon my playmates and ask them to attend my own version of the liturgy. <laughs> for the body of Christ, we use this biscuit, Marie, and for the blood of Christ, we substituted it with the miraculous drink everyone knows, Coke. I first learned to mimic the words of consecratory prayers long before I learned how to read. Looking back, I would have been a good priest. I had a good attendance and church goers, and it kept on growing and growing that even other children in a nearby village would come to our house to see me lead in their prayers and perform our Eucharistic meals. <laughs> I remember that my parents allowed me to do this role playing, this performance, until things have to be stopped at certain point because the expenses I have incurred <laughs> is already beyond the budget of the family. I don't do collection. <laughs> the biscuits and the coke are items for sale in the Sari Sari store of my mother, but there was no direct prohibition from my parents lest I get discouraged and may even turn rebellious. One Sunday, my parents brought me to the church and together with so many people unknown to me, we attended my first Sunday Mass. It was an event to remember. I felt at the time that I was seeing his kingdom come on earth. 
There were more images of the saints gloriously martyred and petrified on the side of the altars, all bedecked with flowers and burning scented candles. But the solemnity is tempered by the other events happening simultaneously outside, outside the church as other people were doing their businesses. Indeed, there is a very thin line that separates the, the spiritual to the practical. The ice cream vendor ringing his bell to call the attention of his potential clients while an altar boy unceremoniously rings his bell during the benediction. Outside, there was also the pink cotton candy, seductively soft and tastier than the sacred clothes. And while the made of cement cherubs are stacked on their heavenly altars, I saw another child crying miserably for she accidentally released her red balloon. I saw how her mother tried to pinch her. To appease the child, the father decided to call the itinerant photography photographer. One, two, three, smile. The camera captured and pacified the moment. In that busy churchyard of provincial city, of a provincial city, I would discover the novenas, these little booklets written in three languages, the standard Biko, the national language, the Tagalog, and the more universal language, English. Sold alongside with amorphous shapes, with candles of amorphous shapes and religious medals that are popularly known as anting-anting or am am amulets. These were, there were other reading materials which later on I would realize are not really religious readings, but more of a secular kind, a booklet of dreams, for instance, and their assigned meanings. This is called prognostico. Folk tales, adventure stories, and mini almanacs, and even vehicle translations of Romeo and Juliet, Othello, Macbeth, among others. Later on, I would discover the printer of these novenas, which continue to exist until today. The novenas produced by Cecilio Press. This is the name of the printing press, serve, which serve as my first reading materials. After the mass, if this, budget, if this budget permits, my father will buy me a novena to a saint. I would easily learn and memorize the life stories and miracles attributed to these particular saints. And of course, the effectiveness of their prayers addressed to them in case of needs. This is the time you have to listen to me very closely. For snakes and other wild animals, you go to San Benito. For the dog attacks, you go to San Roque or Santiago if the other one is busy. <laughs> for stomach aches, Santa Teresa de Avila. For toothaches, Santa Apollonia. And for lost things, uh, this is the busiest of all, <laughs> San Antonio de Padua. <laughs> of the novenas I collected, I particularly remember the Letania para sa aking sadang, litany for the unborn children. The Letania contains the usual intercessory prayers, but what is most striking in this booklet is the valediction of the unborn child. Praying the Letania, I was made to feel indebted and connected to the other siblings I never had a chance to know. They instantly became our heavenly protectors. They can aid us like guardian angels. I remember visiting and lighting a candle in a Catholic cemetery in the home province of my father in Pampanga, where my supposed eldest brother was buried, who is named Pedro, and the other one who is buried in the Barangay Chapel who is named Juan, and then the third one believed to have been devout by an aswang, a nightly creature said to attack pregnant women and sick people. It was after the third miscarriage that my parents decided to seek for the intercession of the saints and made the vow that the male firstborn child would become a priest. I was about to enter the primary school when we started praying again a novena for my mother. This time, not for pregnancy. This time to San Rafael, the patron saint of travelers. My mother was bound for Qatar. She had signed a two-year contract. She would work as a domestic helper, a katabang, to a Muslim family. 
When my mother left us for abroad, my grandmother took care of us while my father continued to work in a government agency. Later on, he would work as a security guard in a shipping company in the United States. So growing up with my, this time now with my grandmother, who was also the folk healer and midwife of our community, introduced me further to the many things that would later inform my poetics. While my parents work outside the country, my grandmother named many pilgrimages to renew her healing powers. In this visita, small shrines of popular devotion to Amang Hinulid, Inang Salvacion, and San Vicente Ferrer, she would renew her vows and gathered her blessed coconut oil. Many times I would also accompany her when she had to visit her parents and perform the act of Santiguar, a contraction of Santo Agua or holy water, which is loosely translated in some texts in English as some kind of extra system. However, the striking difference in Santiguar is there is no acknowledgement of the devil's participation. Satan does not appear in Santiguar if he, they probably belong to another realm. My grandmother's patients were notably calm, unlike those that have been possessed and cinematically reenacted. In the world of Pagsa Santiguar, no one is considered an evil adversary. Instead, the patients are considered to be the guilty trespassers and hence are advised to restore what he or she has violated by offering food for these spirits or by offering masses for the dead. Here's a video of my grandmother doing the Santiguar. They're watching a noontime show, a game show. That's the dog.
in performing the Santiguar, my grandmother would place blessed candle and a coconut oil and a lusang plato or a quasi porcelain plate. Drawing three crosses on the plate, she would begin by whispering her oration, a secret prayer formula which regards which she guards with her life. She would then, then light the candle, and from the formation of the suit on the plate, she would be she would begin her divination. Looking at how my grandmother read the signs on the plate, I was fascinated by her ability to quickly point out what could be wrong with the patient. For example, a spirit we call Apo has been wrong because the patient cut it free without seeking permission, or one failed to remember the death anniversary of a relative. To appease, one must perform the pagapag, a certain kind of Eucharistic feast, where the main recipe should include the glutinous suman or rice cake and a white female chicken pudding guna, which when cooked, cooked should not be salted. People are invited to this feast on this food after the supposed apples had already partaken. A little of this food served during the pagapag is placed in front of the altar. This kind of a live world experience that characterized my childhood, I learned about the existence of another invisible world which can be summoned by a request. And she spoke to them in people. Soon people took notice of my novena collection. I was sort of a wonder child as I can talk about the lives and miracles of these saints. This was in the 90s when we had a major volcanic eruption in my father's home province. There were also earthquakes and typhoons in the news and many Marian apparitions have also been reported. During this time of high religious fervor, I have become a parapanganang together with two older women who happened to be friends of my grandmother. Nana Taki, Nana Bitang, and Nana Idad were the three women of our village that go from one house to another to pray for the novena for the dead. And for some reasons, I became their acolyte. Later, my exposure to the language and to the form that contained in these novenas have greatly informed my poetics, especially the Gosses or the Dalit. These religious poems contain syncretic vocabularies, which makes it open, accessible, mobile, and theatrical. These gospels in the novenas are usually sung like the Passion, which is also performed during funeral weeks. The Passion is considered as one of the early devotional literatures in the vernacular. It recounts the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ. It has five lines and has 40 monosyllabic rhyming scheme, which symbolically represent the 40 days and 40 nights of the Lenten season. Reynaldo Ileto, offers a textual analysis of the same passion and correlates it with the Filipino revolution of 1896 up to the uprisings initiated by the millenarian movements who fought against American colonization. For Ileto, the passion provided an, provided an ethos for the indigenous Catholic population to situate and emancipate from the oppressive colonial experience, framing it within the redemptive value of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The narrative of the cross does not end, however, on the Good Friday, for it bears its fruits and rewards and fulfills the promise of a new world order. There is a new day of Easter, a new revolution that is as inevitable as the resurrection of Christ. For good reasons, I left the seminary in 2004 that coincided with the publication of my first book of poetry in three Philippine languages. In 2011, my grandmother passed on and joined the world of the invisible. And in my eulogy, I took note of the fact that being the midwife to my mother, she was my first human contact. And those hands that pulled me out of this world graciously agreed to serve as the cover for my second book entitled San Iguar, released in 2006, which I also dedicated to her. She was grinning when during one of those book launchings, some people have also sought her to autograph their copies after learning it is her hands that covers the book. In 2013, I published two poetry collections. The first one is Labi. I decided to leave it stress mark free so people can read it the way they want. Labi, it 
will mean lips. La B, it remains, it means remains or carcass. Here, I have continued these religious reckonings by rebel waiting and reformulating a new set of parables of the whale, who's, about the whale who swallowed the prophet, about the crow who failed to do his mission to return to Noah's Ark, among others. I also wrote about biblical sites like the Babylon, Babel, Canaan, and Jerusalem, and turned them into Italo Calvino cities, and filled them with characters whose physical bodies and imagined geographies are drawn and maligned by fear and trembling caused by oppressive religious ontologies. The other collection is Canticos, Apat na Voces, Canticles, Four Voices. Here I intertwine the story of an indigenous girl, a mother of a political rebel, and an old maid mistaken for an aswang who peddles rice cakes every afternoon, which people believe are made of pulverized human bones, and a seminarian who was romantically linked to another seminarian. Most evident in this collection is the reformulation of Bicol folk songs and the Catholic liturgical prayers and hymns to allow these four personas regain their voices again, tempered by a dialectic of power that emanates from the tenacious relationship that exists between what I may call as the folk and the foreign. It is also within this framework that I wrote and directed Angustia and Hinulid that are both based on religious iconographies and lexicons. Two Sundays ago, I came to see the novelist Nuruddin Farah and initially shared with him about this project. And he gently reminded me to observe a stringent life of discipline and devotion, which I believe I have learned from my previous lived world experience. And as a grandchild of Natividad, and, as a, and that is being the grandchild of Natividad and as a former seminarian. The novenary here therefore comes, becomes a kind of structure a mode of preparation, an act of hopeful anticipation that pays attention to my agency as a creative writer. As I am wanting to write this novel in Bicol, it is important for me to return, to trace and locate the history of this language and support my claim that it is indeed an engineered language operated by a Catholic, colonial and complex, complex structures of power. But this does not mean that this power structure was not unflawed. In fact, in the book Counter Hispanization of the Colonial Philippines by Jean Blanco, he cited that certain rulings and arrangements between the Spanish crown and the Roman Catholic Church have made it difficult for the missionary and the local ordinary and the civil officials to work in the same direction of people's evangelization. Oftentimes, religious missionaries would not obey their local bishops citing the exclusive rights given by the Pope to the religious missionaries who are acting as the main actors in the mission frontiers. The kind of ruling is preserved in what has become an idiomatic expression, utos ng hari, hindi mababali, kahit ng hari. A friar's order cannot be questioned even by the king. With the publication of the dictionary, this is the first people dictionary over there, in 17... 54, reprinted in 1865, and a grammar book published in 795. In this language, they separate from the other indigenous groups like the Tagalog and the Visayas. I would like to build a novelistic world of this region I call as my place of my birth. But aside from these lexicographical, lexicographical and textual meanings of the words, I am particularly interested in paying attention to sounds to the sounds, to the articulation and speech, and how these words were traded and negotiated in the context of performing the auricular, the auricular confession. To look not into the miraculous, but to the auraculous, not the optic, but the acoustic. How did the colonial authorities, in particular the prior missionaries, make sense of the different idiolects present in colonial people? If the confession is seen as an instrument of surveillance, of discipline and punishment, an all-seeing eye, a panopticon in this, in this project, I would like to shift my attention to the ears and tongues. I shall investigate how sounds and words were used and abused to govern and rule in the same manner that the same language and apparatus were used as a counter-defense of the indigenous population. The counter-defense is best articulated in many of our folk tales and trickster stories. One story I would like to cite is about a friar 
who upon arriving in a new assignment wanted to test his community. He summoned the people to gather in the church. And when the congregation arrived, the prior called a man named Juan to test the latter's catechetical knowledge. The prior took a crucifix from his pocket and asked Juan if he knows the one who is hanging on the cross. <coughs> Juan obviously does not recognize the man on the cross as the prior instead. Father, I know nothing about this. Would you please let me know who is this poor Spaniard and what crime did he commit to deserve such terrible punishment? Tentatively entitled Auricula, I am interested to create a soundscape, a world of sounds out of the Confessionario or the Manual of Confession written in Bicol by the Franciscan prior Pedro de Avila. In this world, we find the sound of bells and booming homilies delivered from the pulpits as the Pentecosticon, the whole, the all hearing and all talking God. For this project, I benefited from an essay written by Filipino historian Vicente Rafael, particularly his essay entitled Confession, Conversion, and Reciprocity in Early Tagalog Colonial Society. Lurid in its inquiries, allow me to show you a part of the Rafael essay that provides the English translation of the Tagalog Confessionario. This is some kind of a guide questions. There is an English translation. So this is some of the questions under the sixth commandment and the question number 373. And did something dirty come out of your body? Question three, oh, yeah, number 374. And did, you, and did you cause her to emit something dirty too? How many times did you play around in this manner? For example, within a week. And how many times did each of you have an emission? Because not only is this a sin, indeed, it is a very serious sin. Aside from all this, I also suspect that every time you saw her or thought of her, you also lusted for her. Wasn't this the case? And because of your loss, did you do anything to your body, any kind of lewdness? And did your body emit something dirty? Like the Tagalog confessionario, the Bicol confessionario is bilingual, Bicol and Spanish. In another edition of, manu of the Manual for Confession, according to Blanco, the translation of Sixth Commandment has been translated imprecisely as not, do not commit adultery. The translation became do not commit excessive adultery. <laughs> These catalogs of sins and confession practices, according to Jeremy Tumbling, have produced people as subjects with the need to narrate and lay bare the secret of their lives and to define themselves in relation to their own presumed normal sexuality. By inducting themselves into this auricular confession, I argue that the Bicos have found a new way to historicize and fictionalize their identities as active agents in subtle and overt ways of opposition to colonial structures. Reading the confessionario in Bicol, these, are the, these were the things that I have been doing there. And uh, I was thankful that uh, one of our colleagues could help me navigate in the Spanish text, Carlos. I have located several gaps and fissures in the question and answer structure, which have become an ideal space for me to cultivate the novel I wish to inscribe within the source text. I am also interested to examine the idea how auricular confession inaugurated a new kind of liminality and orality among the indigenous population. And since it's also, it also functions as a script, the confession box is also a theatrical space where aspiring roles had to be acted out. Here is an example from the first commandment that covers the sin against idolatry, which briefly ended up with a question on augury. Tuminubud ka sa paghunin tibaad ng gamgam? Oho, padre, nakasaro ang pagtubod ko, ta ako magagadana ako. Did you believe in the song of the evil bird? Yes, father, once I believed in it because I thought I was going to die. This is interesting, considering that one of the Bicol's famous love songs is entitled Sarong Banggi or a Nocturna uh, Sonata. It's about a person who mistook the voice of his beloved to that of a nightbird. 
Noted in Bicol, in the Bicol's Manual of Confession, is the special emphasis on drunkenness. These are the sins of Bicol. Our people's pension to gambling and cockfighting and extramarital relationships and other sorts of things. These similar themes can be found in our folk songs and folk stories as well. In terms of form and the use of language and experimentation, I am deeply challenged by this project, considering that this would mean that I would have to reckon and weigh in my decision to write and observe two orthographies of the Bicol language. I still have to decide on this, but this alone is enough for me to give this a shot, it, and it certainly gives me a kind of excitement closer to an epiphany that I once felt after I got to read Alejandro Zambria's Multiple Choice. That's the book, it's this one, this novel by Zambria. The Chilean novelist parodied the government aptitude test required among Chilean students. By reading and choosing your own answers, you as readers become co-creators of your own little stories found in the various combinations you make as you answer these multiple choices. With the government that dictates you to subscribe to these formulaic formulations that measure you and survey you, you ask the question after going through the novel, if we really do have a choice out of these multiple choices. A Filipino story entitled Horoscope by Eli Rueda Gem achieves this similar effect by using the daily horoscopes which usually, which usually appears in popular tabloids as the structure of the storytelling that connects all 12 astronomical signs to a particular network of entangled and conflicted relationships. So Iris and Taurus, all those things. For the sake of time, I will skip a thorough discussion about the second and third novels that I wish to write. But let me share with you two impetus that made me decide to include these historical periods in my agenda. The impetus for the second novel is another book published in 1915, entitled Francisco, the Filipino, by Bartes M. Little, a formerly American principal of the provincial school in Albay. The province of Albay was also the center of the rise and fall of the abaca trade industry in the early 20th century. The social historian Norman Owen described this period in our history as the age of prosperity without progress. The third novel will highlight the horrible years of the Pacific War, which gave us the word collaborator, meaning allied with the Japanese. Now, in a restaurant in Naga, known for its Filipino-Spanish cuisine, is a huge mural of a woman dressed in a typical Maria Clara fashion, named Soledad. Very few people know that this woman in that restaurant was one of those who were killed, who was killed with the Japanese. The woman together with her husband, a former governor of the province and one of their children are all buried in a nearby church. And they were executed by a group of Filipino guerrillas in one of the coastal towns of the province. The said governor was suspected to be a Spanish collaborator. This planned quartet, which begins in the confessionary box, will culminate with the advent and the rise of the radio in the same provincial town. Meet the local weatherman named Isidro Labordo, an employee, an employee of the newly instituted PAGASA that stands for the Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration. Isidro makes weather reports for his community and doubles as the mysterious and anonymous storyteller in another popular radio program. By creating a twofold persona through his voices, he retells the old corridors and folk tales, reads the Calendarium Bicol and the Prognosticos, and uses it to promote and justify Ferdinand Marcos' declaration of martial law and the establishment of Pagong Lipunan, a new society, in 1972. In an interview with Playboy in 1987, just to uh, give you the flavor, the couple in exile candidly participated in the same Q&A, not in a, in a confession manual style, but in a Playboy interview. The cover line for the story reads, 
an epic interview with Imelda and Ferdinand Marcos on beauty, tyranny, and the secrets of human nature. Playboy, you think of yourselves. You think of yourselves as gods then, Imelda. Yes, because we are on a divine mission. Playboy, which is Imelda, to return to the Philippines to reclaim our destiny. Ferdinand, we are part of the achievement of being a god. That is what we are about now. An ordinary mortal would not be able to stand it. All of our statements now have to prove that we have not gone back to being ordinary mortals. Imelda, and even if we fail, Ferdinand will fall as martyrs for the cause, will fall with honor. In the same Playboy interview, the obviously dying Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos said that history is not yet true with him, with me. And fast forward, despite being overthrown from political power in 1986 revolution, Isidro, the character in this project, anticipated the glorious vindication of the Marcoses, which happened in 2022 with the presidential election of Ferdinand Jr. Now in his advanced age and showing some signs of senility, Isidro tries to, intimate, to intimately hold on to what he remembers as the golden age of Philippine history. And this is so because for him, the Marcoses possess supernatural powers comparable only to extraterrestrials. Here, I would like to look into how the art of storytelling, both oral and written, including cinema, were appropriated by the dictatorship and were made to consume by a generation of Filipinos believing in the idea that the Marcos period is a golden one. I am also aware that these projects may generate various reactions and may simply label it as an anti-Marcos or even as an apology to the Marcoses, but this is not my concern at the moment. Let me show you what I managed to take note so far in relation to this project. Bicol, being one of the major gateway of the tropical typhoons, is reliant to weather reports. It's the voice of God. Most of our farmers and fisher folks rely on the radio for, their, for this forecast and for their daily news and nightly entertainments. Set in the martial law, Isidro Lab Labordo is the oraculus and the miraculous change of the sound of his voice reporting about the weather he miraculously changed the sound of his voice reporting the reporting about the weather from one radio program to another radio program that narrates how Ferdinand Marcos becomes the Malacas, the strong one. These are our actual paintings. And how Imelda Marcos is our Maganda, the beautiful maiden, the true father and mother of the Bagong Lipunan, and the Marcos children as the benevolent extensions of this parentage. This is Labordo's Bildungs Roman. In Pio Abad's project, Fear of Freedom Makes Us See Ghosts, he claimed that Imelda Marcos thinks he is a reincarnation of an ancient queen. Abad recounts. In an autobiography published in 1980, Imelda recounts the events following her assassination attempt in 1972 when a man named Carlito de Mahili lunched at her with a bolo knife during an awarding ceremony, lacerating her, heart, her arms and hands. While recuperating in the hospital, she had a vision of the ancient queen, like a guess, Semiramis, leading a huge crowd praying for her recovery and invoking her to rejoin the stream of life. Imelda would later reveal that prior to this incident, an Indian mystic had once told her that she was the incarnation of Semiramis, the Assyrian queen who became a ruler of the vast Neo-Assyrian Empire following the death of her husband, Shamshi Ada V. A painting commissioned by Imelda to commemorate this revelation mistakenly depicts Semiramis as another ancient ruler the Egyptian queen, Nefertiti. <laughs> An error that was never rectified nor explained." End quote. The Marcoses also appropriated religious narratives to their own myth-making, be it the Santo Nino or Our Lady of 
you know, there are so many other ladies in the Philippines. In playing syncretic, they consulted psychics and numerologists to support their legitimacy to power. In a previous essay, I wrote about the loss and finding of Our Lady of Benin Francia, fondly called by the Bicolanos as Our Ina, Our Mother. I highlighted the role of Imelda Marcos when she donated a substitute image of the Ina, and many claim that the image she donated resembled like her. With a character like Isidro, who is a true-blooded Marcos loyalist, I imagine him as a new Panacosticon. He provides an alternative universe of the Marcosian propaganda of the true, the good, and the beautiful by highlighting the moral values like the utang na buot or a depth of gratitude, a practice of endless reciprocity which, according to Vicente Rafael, finds its inception in the devotional materials produced during the Spanish colonial period. Here, I would like to illustrate how Isidro creates his own intimate life in relation to the Marcoses. In the last of the quartet, I returned to the same image of the confessionary box, now turned into a radio studio as a site of surveillance and controlling apparatus. But the radio is also our Sumbuman, a site for communal forum where one may wash the dirty linens. It is through the radio that we lodge our complaints and reports of uses. It is through the radio that we get to listen to the latest updates, the herbal medicines, the gossips about showbiz celebrities and politicians, public announcements, marriage bans, obituaries, our almanac of our daily lives ad infinitum. Today, the radio remains as powerful as the pulpit in shaping public opinions and standards or the lack of it. So in this novel, I would like to architect a chapter that will enable people to trap to read the radio or the stories about the radio. But what about extraterrestrials? Unlike the Hollywood imaginary, unlike in the Hollywood imaginary where aliens coming from large spaceships would frequently attack the same lane of coffee shops in New York, <laughs> in this provincial small town, it's the golden apple snails that will take the center stage. An invasive species introduced during the Marcos regime to serve as an alternative source of protein for Filipino farmers. Imelda thought of even exporting the same snails to France. She was even seen in television extolling its virtues and enjoying the scargo, but no amount of propaganda can save the whole damn thing from invading the whole country. Imelda can only consume quite a small of quite a few of these snails that if not mitigated, it is the snails that can actually literally eat the whole country. The farcical story of the golden apple snails continues to be a major threat to Filipino farmers up to today. It is the golden menace, not the golden age. Native to South America, where it is not considered a chronic pest, it was introduced in the Philippines in 1982, and it has proliferated widely from the rice terraces in the north up to the high islands in the Visayas and, and in Mindanao. According to a report, by Bridget Anderson. These snails are described as voracious eaters of rice, the Filipino staple food, and as it is a good eater, it is also an indefatigable breeder. In one year, one snail will commonly produce 15,000 offspring. Oh Despite their large size, the snails can survive very crowded situations. They have two breathing organs, a fill, a, a gill, and a lung that is attached to a three-inch snorkel-like tube. Day and night, they move in search of food to satisfy their phenomenal appetites. Mm -hmm. An infestation of snail can destroy a field of newly planted rice overnight. Reports from the Department of Agriculture consider these snails as major rice pests, causing greater damage than locusts, green leaf hoppers or rice tungru virus. In a report from the USA, it is estimated that around 800,000 hectares of rice land were infested with the snails out of the 3 million hectares planted with rice in the Philippines. How to turn these scientific reports, these interviews with Playboy, and these historical and archival materials into a tapestry of stories that people can access is the challenge that I have imposed upon myself. <laughs> I find some meanings in the fact that months after martial law declared 
But Marcos Sr., months after he declared martial law, she all, he also enacted laws creating the Cultural Center, a National Grain Institute, and the Pagasa. All on December 11, 1972. These presidential decrees, policies, laws, be it the Manual of Confession or the official gazettes, are narratives or storylines that should be subjected to our reading, to our annotations, to our writing. These are materials that, in, that can inform my own fiction writing. This is a way of writing back somehow. And by inserting and imagining the Biko language from an active source of energy, of agency, I, the writer, the creative, who is conscious of the fact that in writing about this fictive world where the Marcuses are con considered as spectral presences, we hold and carry on, we behold them and their stories and their lies, for they are our own mirror that reflect our failures, our monstrosities. In one of the conversations I had with our resident novelist, Jennifer, from birthday Jen, I was drawn by her insight on this notion of monstrosity and how we take on our lives and carry within us a sense of right history that easily puts us on the side of truth and justice. But how do we account for people like Isidro? Is this the banality of evil, Pumla? And indeed, who will be responsible for these monstrosities? These grand mythical narratives about this family who have claimed themselves as our destinies. In characterizing Isidro, this weatherman and radio drama actor, I lay these questions. How does one report about the weather during the martial law years when people went missing and never to be found again? How long can one hold to his version of truth, his version of the weather? How do you keep your loyalty when you know that you are about to lose your memory? Is Isidro a trickster or is it his memory that is the trickster? The Marcosian memories and the bearers of this golden age move like golden apple snails. They seem slow, but the stage of our country's political dramas after the Pacific War has always been characterized and dominated by the narratives of this man from the north, Ferdinand, his wife from the south, Imelda, and their families now scattered in our political structures again. But about who? As a child, growing up in Iriga, in front of us is a vast rice field that today be drawn to this beautiful site. The delicate egg snails, snails which were which we were asked to crush. And the other image, the image that you see, is that of the Makahiya, which I consider to be so magical that I spent time trying to touch it every time I would see one. The first one we crush, the second one we touch, both with the joy of the mortal hands. From this childhood experience, a poem in Philippine, which I would like to read to you now, and the English translation is here. Sapagkat daliri. Kinasuklaman ko kaagad ang angking kagandahan ng ilang bagay, katulad ng mga rosas na itlog ng kohol sa palayan na paisa-isa kong pinsa. Nakakatakot ang kanilang pagdami at dahil noon pa man inasam ko na balang araw, makakakita ako ng mga kaluluwa o kaya'y pulutong ng mga anghel ng koho na mag-aalsa ng digmaan laban sa akin. Ngunit malamang walang itinitira ang, aking, ang kanilang kamatay ang aking kaloob. Walang silbi ang kahit anumang labi, walang halaga ang kahit anumang labis, walang bertud sa aking pagmamalabis. Ganoon pa man, pinaghandaan ko pa rin ang sandaling pakikipagtuos sa inaakalang hukbo. 
kung kaya tinipong ko ang mga tinik ng makahiya na sa unang pagkakataon ay inakala kong isang halamang hayo. Nakakaramdam at nagkukuyong ang mga ito sa bawat pagdantay at noon ko ay pinagpalagay na may taglay ngang kapangyarihan ng aking mga daliri na kaya rin maging aso, ibon at koneho ng anino nito. Simula noon, kinilala ko isa-isa ang aking mga daliri. Ginawa ko silang mga kawal ng nagbabadyang digmaan. Ipinagbawal ko ang pagpitas ng kahit anong bulaklak, lalo na ang namumukadkad sa tuwing alas dose ng tanghali. Itinuro sa intuturo na hindi lahat ng dapat ay maaari mariing tinanggihan ang singsing na magtatagi sa akin sa isang inaalok na pag-ibig. Bawal ang pagkulay sa kanilang mga kuko at sa halip ginawa ko itong mga buto, mga kalasag. Tinuruan ko silang ituring ang bawat isa bilang kapantay, walang hinlalaki, walang hindi liit. Ngunit labis na tinik ang nalikom ng aking mga daliri. At ngayon sa huling sandali ng pakikipagtunggali, bigla itong nagkuyong isang patay na kamao semento. Kung mamarapatin mong buksan ang aking pala, dahan-dahanin lamang maraang isa-isahin ang mga daliri na parang nagbubunot ng mga talulot. Pakiusap, baka sumugat ang mga tinik ng makadya at mapisa ang ilang mga nalalabing rosas ng itlog. Tanging ito na lamang ang mga huling pihar. I share this poem to all of you to remind myself that literature is always an ode to hope. In Bicol, the word for hope is paglaom, the one that you must keep. And these lines from the apocryphal gospels best summarize all the things I have tried to share with you today. If you use what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not use what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for uh, uh, giving us a glimpse of this extraordinary uh, tapestry, as you call it, that you're weaving uh, all the different strands. Um, I also wanted to say a word of welcome to everyone who's joined us online. Oh, okay. Welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see so many guests. Um, you're welcome to post some comments in the chat lines. We'll, we'll be able to pick up on, on them as well. And I'll yeah. take any responses, questions, and comments from the room. Yeah. Well, before, yeah, there are two Did hands. You? I'd like to uh, say hi first to some of our friends in the Philippines, uh, Professor Aguilar, uh, John Mary, uh, Nene Santa Romana Cruz, Professor Dirain. Thank you all for coming, uh, Paolo, and to my dean. <laughs> <laughs> They're always everywhere. <laughs> yes. Wow, what a beautiful reading of your poem and in the complex stories that you uh, want to leave uh, for your work. I didn't read the poem, but listened to your reading. It was really spectacular, beautiful language and reading. Um, I'm interested in the notion of hope. I, so you started at the beginning of your presentation with reference to hope and you end with the words, what about hope? And it's it's um, it, it's it's something that, I mean, do, how we touch hope, what hope means, and all of these questions about what does it mean to hope in the in the face of of atrocity and in the face of these really overwhelming histories. And I've been wondering about whether there's something else other than hope that we might think of, something perhaps that is even beyond hope, uh, the notion of possibility, the notion of the possible. And, and I thought about this again when you presented these two images, one of the eggs that you must crush, and the beautiful soft uh, flower that you touch. Um, and, and it seems to me that Perhaps we might think, rather than hope, we might we might think of the possible as something that is beyond hope, because 
if you think about hope, it's almost as if you think you think about. I mean, hope kind of gets you stuck in a way because it's almost like something that's happening tomorrow. You're hoping it's going to happen tomorrow, or you're hoping it's going to happen whenever. And yet, when you think about it, is the possible? It keeps it open. It keeps that idea of the possible open. And, and so again, when you speak about something inside of you as something that will issue out the possible, uh, makes me think more about this idea of the possible, mm -hmm. which it seems to me is beyond hope. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, there's a beautiful prayer by Michelle Eckhart that goes like, Lord, give us possibilities. That's that's the prayer. Give us possibilities. And I, I, I agree with you when we think of hope, we think of I, I think of you know this this ordinary folks. They they hope that the weather will be fine tomorrow. That kind of hoping that the weather will be fine tomorrow is something that I would like to articulate in the sense that in the context of the Bicolanos, this everyday life is usually, usually no one takes notice of this everyday life, this everyday resistance, this, this, this little intimacies that may actually find us some, some possible stories that, uh, that would not just see things as if this is black, this is white. That that is what I'm trying to avoid here. I'm I'm touching a I'm touching a very sensitive character. I know that. You know, this this man that I am inventing in my head, this is Cedro Laborde. Oh, goodness gracious, why did I even think of this? Will will what 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 would we how do we deal with this man who uses science, his little science? To, to to serve the dictatorship, but at the same time, something something in 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 the in the in the in that universe will make you will will attract you to to him. Will make you understand his his reasons for for believing that this is the golden age. I, I, I'm I'm weighing all these options, so maybe because of this kind of uh, we call it in the Philippines alanganin. The word is alanganin. This 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 positionality. I'd like to go back into the past and see how did we come to this kind of living, this kind of living our lives. And I'm I'm finding it in the in the period of colonial experience in the Philippines when we say about colonialism, it's not as very strong as what you have here in Africa. I mean, yes, we were colonized by the, Span the, the by Spain and America and the Japanese, but I still have to see what does that mean to be colonized when, you know, you have the Catholic Church being there and you have the America, the, the English, your education being there. I think our colleague Charlie here also shared this kind of, of, of a project with you. So, yeah. We'll see. We'll hope. Yes. Happy birthday, Jen. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was wonderful. And we're so happy to hear that you plan to write in your first language. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of questions, but I'm only going to ask Go. one and then <laughs> I get a It's a birthday, be gentle. Yes. <laughs> ah, you <laughs> don't give me the chance. <laughs> you might regret it. <laughs> so, uh, but first of all, I want to take you to the novelistic action, you know, the actual writing of the novel. So, you've given up what you're intending to do and what has informed it, yes? Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like you to talk about a little bit about the actual writing of a novel. So, who is your main character? Mm -hmm. What is the story? I know you gave us a bit of the uh, 
the setting where the story is fidgeting, that is your home thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would have liked to hear that uh, this is a story of of a man or a woman or whatever. And this is what happens today. You know, whatever has mm -hmm. formed in your mind here, mm -hmm. I know. And also because you really don't know what is what this character, who he is or what he is, is going to surprise you and the story is going to change mm -hmm. a lot. But it would have been good for you and for us to hear bits of that. Yeah. Uh, well, there are easy routes in, in deciding that this will be the characters that I'm going to to have a piece for 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 the first novel mm -hmm. that I'll be I'm I still have to do a lot of readings. I still have to do a lot of uh, research. But I'm the, the easy route would be to put the character of Pedro Avila who mm -hmm. is responsible for writing that scenario. And um, for Solidar in the third novel, and Francisco the Filipino, who is the subject of that American textbook. But I think the the, the, the other ch the, 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 the challenge that I'm carrying with me right now is how to really create this kind of environment, this kind of world that will be responsible even to my characters. I, I have this kind of moral responsibility to my characters that I have to uh, really uh, do it well this time. And you, you notice it during the, the screening of the, the Angusia that the way I presented my character, the indigenous woman in the film, how she is eroticized by her world. And it seems that the narrative leans towards the, the male characters of the film. I um, I thank you for, for pointing that out because that is, the kind of of life that I need at this point, it, it's it's very difficult, and I, I cannot I cannot I cannot yet give you that much in terms of you know pointing out these characters. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested. I'm I'm excited to feel to flesh some things out with this my name is Isidro Lagordo that I'm. I'm thinking of doing my own radio program when I go back to the Philippines, mm -hmm. just to experience how it is to be mm -hmm. in a radio, in that kind of studio. So I talk to the local church. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to a religious order, the Franciscans. Mm -hmm. So this gave me a program when I return, like a 30 minute program, just to experience. And in a way, I'm, I'm not in a rush for, for these projects. And Roland Barthes is something, is some kind of a figure here, like the novel is a fantasized form, so, something like you fetishize on it, let it grow in you, mm -hmm. you know, Barthes mm -hmm. has this um, mm -hmm. long, long meandering mm -hmm. thought process. Mm -hmm. he, he only got eight pages of his supposed uh, uh, planned novel, which was entitled Vita Nova until he got stuck, uh, he got hit by a laundry car. So maybe one day I can, we, we, I think that's the, that's the thing about this program, we can continue the conversation and, you know, update each other in terms of, you know, the, 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 the work that they do. So, yeah. Keep the WhatsApp group going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else? At that note, we'll make the promise we to don't keep it going. From the anyone, uh, if there's anyone online who wanted to make a... Okay, thank you all who are here. Jason, that would be nice. Thank you, Jason. John. Okay. Are you? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Nancy.